which it will be convenient to consider 34, 36 and 37. Hannah Bardell. Hugely important uh, debate and discussion, and, uh, and we are we're really pleased that these amendments have been selected. I will speak to our amendments uh, as indicated 33, 34, 36, and 37. And I think it's important to say in the outset that clauses one and two, uh, the amendments that we have made to those, would ensure the principles of devolution are safeguarded in this bill as the UK leaves the EU. And as it's just over 20 years since devolution, I think it's important to pause for thought, and I, I know there's been a lot of discussion, uh, in, in certainly in, in the second reading and, and, and discourse in the public, that you know, the agreement, the cross-party agreement that brought us devolution uh, all that time ago, and, and, and the parliaments and assemblies of the devolved nations of the UK are, in our view, under threat. And there is much in this legislation that drives uh, a horse and coaches through uh, cross-party agreements that have brought uh, huge changes to the devolved nations of the UK and in many respects I would argue that threatening that devolution process and the devolved powers and uh, the SNP have set out 111 areas um, that are under threat uh, undermines the union. So those who are fervent protectors and defenders of the United Kingdom and, and the Union, in many respects you could argue that, that this uh, puts it under threat. So let me go specifically to firstly Amendment 33. We agree with the provision in Clause 1 that aims to ensure continued access to government procurement markets after the UK leaves the EU. However, we believe that UK ministers ought to seek the consent, not just the consultation, because during the withdrawal bill and in the promises that the Prime Minister made to the devolved nations of the UK was that we would be consulted. As we know, uh, the situation in Northern Ireland has meant that proper consultation has not been able to be sought. And you know, we look forward uh, to see what will happen in Northern Ireland and the threat that this poses. But I think it's fair to say that consultation was not something uh, that the other devolved nations really felt had. And, and so for us, consultation and consent are absolutely the bottom line. So our amendment would ensure that the consent of the Scottish minister, uh, ministers or Welsh ministers is required for any regulations made by the provisions of Clause 1 that deal with matters within the competence of devolved authorities in Scotland and Wales. And in the language briefing, it says responsibilities for much of procurement law made from uh, the UK to EU, moved from UK to the EU uh, with Brexit. There are questions about who takes on their responsibilities because at present responsibilities for pr procurement are generally devolved or set at EU level, devolved legislatures in Scotland and Wales implement EU directives le uh, direct, sorry, directly. Um, and, and I just want to draw on a, a specific example that occurred to me that I, I, you know, procurement is something that is probably quite dry and technical to many people, but it is actually very, very important. So in Scotland, we had a big challenge back in 2008, as I know many hospitals across the UK did with superbugs. Uh, and, and sickness. And we actually, through government procurement, were able to take back uh, those, those contracts from private firms into government control. And that is something that I think was absolutely vital. And so those are the kinds of things that if we are not able to uh, guarantee uh, our procurement rights and, and, and if, people, if, if our amendments are not supported, then there is a risk that that would be lost. And in those 111 areas, um, there, those are obviously discussed and I know and what I would say to my colleagues on the Labour bench is to think very carefully given that it was their party that were instrumental in devolution and they have to be congratulated for that but they must reflect on the impact that this legislation has and the opportunity of the amendments that have been laid I believe with you know a degree of cross-party consensus and support um, that it would be excellent that if we do choose to push these to a vote and we will obviously listen to you know, full discussion and debate that we would get their support and perhaps even some on the government benches who would deem you know, the, the promises made to Scotland uh, in the past to lead the UK, not leave the UK, uh, to be an equal partner. All of those words, all of that rhetoric, let it not be rhetoric, let it be something that you actually stand by. Uh, in terms of Amendment 34, we agree with the provision in Clause 2 that aims to provide continuity to trade deals that the UK is currently part of by virtue of its EU membership. And let's not forget 
that it is, you know, uh, 40 trade deals, around 40 trade deals with over 60 countries, and we've heard a huge amount of evidence uh, from across a number of different organisations. And just today from uh, Devro, who are, who are uh, do sausage skins essentially, so you know, you could argue that there might be no breakfast after Brexit if a, a company like Devro and their products are, are put under threat and they are not able to produce the, the skins for the sausages. Um, and uh, other companies um, such as uh, Bologic, who are actually from my Livingston constituency, and I, I visited some time ago, who spoke about the importance of uh, consultation and consent and involvement of the devolved nation. So, you know, we believe UK ministers ought to seek the consent of devolved ministers when they're amending the law in devolved areas. The amendment would ensure that the consent of the Scottish ministers or Welsh ministers is required for any regulations made by the provisions of clause 2 that deal with matters within the competence of devolved authorities in Scotland and Wales. And again, I would say to all of our colleagues um, you know, across the House, think about when those, those trade deals are being negotiated, when we are in the position, and I know that this bill is about bringing you know, the current deals across, but it is also about what happens beyond that and about the framework that is put in place and ensuring it is a framework that is good and robust for everybody in the UK, wherever their business is and wherever they live. And, you know, it would be incredible to think that we would not get support, particularly from our Labour colleagues, uh, on ensuring that the devolved <coughs> administration, whoever they may be in Wales, would have a say, would, have, uh, would, would be able to get consent uh, on, on the, the decisions that are, that are made uh, for those I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady. Can I just be clear? Let us say a major treaty were going forward in the interests of Scottish whisky, for example. Mm. Is it therefore her position that Welsh ministers should be able to veto that? I thank the Honourable Gentleman for, for his intervention. I think the point of what we are saying is that it must be absolutely the case that every devolved nation, when, and, and those are things that can be discussed. I'm not going to draw on particular areas in the same way that if uh, you know, Welsh lambs, uh, you know, should, we, should we have a veto over it and say that, that we should be interfering. I would like to think that if it came to that, uh, that situation, that the Welsh government and whoever was in power in Wales would take a sensible approach and realise that it was the right thing that the government in Scotland, uh, whoever, whichever colour it may be, should be able to have consent and consultation over products that are coming out of its nation, and that we should have an even hand across the UK uh, in, in relation to Just that. Just so. on that point, if I may briefly. Um, oh, uh, I'm not because she said no to that. Um, in other words, as it stands, consent means that uh, the treaty in question cannot go forward. So again, I'll just put it to her. If there was a major interest in Scotland, and it was vetoed as under her amendment by Welsh ministers, is that the intention of her amendment? No, that absolutely isn't the intention of my amendment, and uh, we're all, we all live in a world at the moment where we can put scenarios forward and say this might happen or that might happen. But the, the, the point of this but, yeah, but, but the, and, and the point of our amendments is that goods that are coming from whichever part of the UK are coming from, that we do not create a democratic deficit, which is what this bill does, and our amendment rectifies that. Now, when we come on to... Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And, and um, I'm, I'm very proud of the uh, Labour government's role in delivering devolution to Scotland uh, and, and Wales. Um, and, and I appreciate the fact that she, she's mentioned that. Can she just give a, a contrast between when, there is, when she sees there is the need for the consent of the devolved administrations and when there is the need for consultation of them? Um, and perhaps she could give some examples to... Uh, demonstrate the difference. Well, I, I think, to be honest, the, the point is that we have the powers and we can have that discussion on an issue-by-issue issue basis. Now, we have you know, many examples where we have worked well you know, with, the, with the UK government uh, on trade uh, and, on, and on rights, but if we look at things like, for example, uh, we take workers' rights, for example, and I know uh, the Honourable Gentleman, when the Trade Union Bill uh, came to Parliament, there were many, many in his party and across other parties that had huge issues uh, and it was hotly debated and discussed. And unfortunately, what we've seen is a rolling back, despite the fact 
that there was opposition. Now, you know, if we're going to turn that on its head and say, well, you know, could there be vetoes from other parts of the UK, or you know, could we be in a position where one country is blocking a trade deal uh, on a particular product over the other within within the United Kingdom? I'd like to think that that people are not going to use those powers in the way that the UK has often used its powers to impose legislation on devolved nations against their will. And the whole point is that the rights and protections and the opportunities and the access and the membership of the single market and the customs union is so vital, as he knows to Wales, to Scotland, to the rest of the UK, to roll back on those and not, there not be the opportunity for the devolved nations to consent and consult. Uh, and, and, you know, we could pick any particular issue and we could all have a discussion between us about whether there should be consent uh, or consultation. I think the point is that we have the powers and it's powers for a purpose and not powers uh, and not have power taken away. Um, and uh, on, particularly on Amendment uh, 36, um, Schedule 1 uh, provides uh, the Scottish <coughs> ministers and Welsh ministers cannot use the power of the trade bill uh, to modify any retained direct EU legislation such as EU regulations or make regulations that would create inconsistencies with any modifications to retained law that the UK government has made even in devolved areas. However, these restrictions are not placed on UK ministers. So we believe that as a matter of principle, devolved ministers should have the same power in respect of matters falling within devolved competence as UK ministers are being given. And that does not seem, uh, we feel, like an unreasonable request that if we are, if we are in a union and we have uh, devolved powers and devolved governments, that our ministers in each of those countries should have the same power as any UK minister. And this amendment would remove the restrictions placed on the Scottish and Welsh minister's ability to amend directly applicable EU law incorporated into UK law, bringing the powers into line with those being given to UK ministers. And on Amendment 37, uh, this amendment would replace uh, requirements imposed on Scottish and Welsh ministers to seek UK ministers' consent when acting alone under section 1.1 or 2.2 with the requirement to uh, consult UK ministers before making those uh, provisions. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I go back uh, to some of the, the comments that we've had um, from previous stakeholders. I, I'll just say on the record, I, I'm sorry I was not here at the earlier evidence sessions I was at the Council of Europe, uh, but I have watched and read uh, the contributions that have come. Um, and stakeholders as we know, I've been invited to give evidence and, and discuss their concerns. Chris Southworth from the International Chamber of Commerce UK said, overall I'd be concerned if I were a devolved administration. There, are, there is specifically no opportunity for the devolved administrations or the regions, I have to say, to feed into decisions on trade. I'd be very concerned about that, particularly in the devolved administrations, where there are vulnerabilities on, on a whole range of different industries. So these are not just us uh, in, on the SNP benches or indeed other benches um, making political points, These are, this is what we have heard uh, even in committee, and we, and we heard, you know, today in terms of uh, food safety, Scotland, um, Elspeth, uh, who came from, from there, saying that her, and, and one of the reasons they are supporting the Scottish government on withholding uh, a legislative consent motion is because they feel there could be uh, a denigration of food and, and, and drink standards. And given that Scotland's food and drink industry has grown at twice that of the rest of the UK, and it is a leading light for our exports, uh, that's something, and, and even and the Scotch Whiskey Association, a really interesting point that was raised by a number of members here on geographical indicators and the absolutely vital place of that. Now, I know that there is no minister in the UK government that would want to see Scotch lose its GI. I absolutely believe that, and I, 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 I would not question that. However, we have to ask ourselves, that if once we get into trade deals, once we get into the situation <coughs> where these things uh, are being debated and we're going back and forth and there are a number of competing priorities, how do we know, without the protections of the EU, uh, that these things are not going to be denigrated? We, we simply don't. And, and the thought of that happening seems incredible and, and, and just the, the impact. And obviously, what was interesting, I think, from what uh, Sarah said, was that the Scotch was... Scot uh, uh, Scotch whisky industry were actually uh, association were actually having to look at that. They were having to look at what the impact would be. So they are spending vital time, money, and energy uh, on you know all of this 
uh, I would argue, unnecessarily. Now, Michael Clancy from the Law Society of Scotland said there's clearly an issue about how the Sewell Convention or Legislative Consent uh, Convention is interpreted in respect of that. Any proposals in UK Parliament legislation that seek to alter the legislative competence of the Parliament of Scottish Ministers uh, require the consent of the Parliament. And Professor Winters from the UK Trade Policy Observatory said Parliament and devolved administrations need to have an important role in setting mandates and there needs to be consultation and information during the process. And, and in written evidence, which we, we received a huge amount of, the Fair Trade Foundation, Trade Justice Movement, Global Justice Now and Tradecraft all clearly express the need for devolved administrations uh, and chambers to be given a formal role in the UK's future trade policy. Uh, you know, these again, many, many organisations I've met with, about 50 different businesses and <coughs> trade organisations in the last uh, eight months, and, and all are in, uh, in agreement that you know, the threat is significant, but also that the devolved nations absolutely should have that vital role. They didn't all necessarily agree that we should have them um, uh, the, the, you know, have the right to veto, but, uh, but many of them could absolutely see our perspective. So I hope uh, that our colleagues uh, on the Labour benches will, will take our amendments in the very positive spirit that they are meant, that devolution has delivered for all parts uh, of the devolved nations, that has brought us greater rights, protections, a unique and distinctive voice in the world. And I think that whilst Brexit diminishes, sadly, the UK's reputation, uh, in the world, it is also seeking to diminish the powers uh, that the devolved nations have, and we absolutely cannot let that happen. Amendment 33 proposed to Clause 1.